Today's guest fled Iran when he was 10 years old and lived in a German refugee camp before immigrating to the U.S. in 1990. After graduating high school, he served in the military before transitioning into entrepreneurship, where he built and sold his company for $300 million. Hey, we're gonna have a strategy session dinner and we're gonna go talk about how we can XYZ to kill everybody here in the business and compete. Like you guys are speaking my language. Simultaneously, he's built a media empire, Valuetainment, to 8 million followers, creating engaging business content and interviewing prominent figures like Kobe Bryant, Dwayne Rock Johnson, and President George Bush. For me, when it comes down to voting, I believe in earning the right to vote. In this episode, we'll dive into his journey from poverty to wealth, his philosophies on business and mindset, as well as his honest views on God, family, and freedom. My mother's side, they were big believers of uh, communism, and my dad's side, they were big believers of imperialism. I've seen some of the best debates with plates flying. Patrick Bet David, welcome to the Jack Neal Podcast. It's great to be here. Yeah, thank you for taking the time, man. Uh, so we're here in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, you settled down here a few years ago coming from LA. That's where I live now. But you've lived in a lot of places. Iran, 10 years, Germany, two years, mm -hmm. Texas, five years, California, 23 years, North Carolina and Kentucky. You were at Fort Campbell. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Um, so I'm from Kentucky myself for the viewers who don't know that. Um, what do you think of the South versus the West Coast? The South I mean, the Southern hospitality is is a real thing. Yeah, uh, it's not even a question. Southern hospitality, when, when uh, my wife, when I first met my wife in June of 02, she had moved to LA from Houston, wanting to pursue acting. Yeah. And she was so kind the way she would speak. And she was so like easy going. And I'm like, there, there's no way in the world you really like this all the time. And she was with another guy. But, uh, and when I was in the army, I had a lot of friends from South as well. Some of them were very good at drinking beer. They yeah. were professionals. They almost tried to finish all the beer when we were in the <laughs> army together, they failed miserably but they they had that that vibe and that feel so if if texas when we lived in dallas if the, the lifestyle of in dallas of dallas was similar to the one here we would have stayed in dallas i love dallas but i wanted to be closer to east coast because i love new york and you know eventually we became minority owners of yankees so if we go to a game we just easy flight to go up and come down and if i'm going to europe where people are coming to me Strategically, I felt long-term with what I was going to build, Florida was a better headquarters, home office for us than anything else. And then the vision's always been to build a life that uh, my entire life is within three mile radius. Yeah. And that's exactly what it is right now. You know, when you lease a car and, and you're a salesperson, you want as many miles as possible every year, 15, 20,000 miles. When we lease our car right now, you give us 2,500 miles per year, we're good because this is exactly where we go. We go nowhere else. So I would say Southern hospitality, phenomenal. Uh, California is, is a little bit of everything. doesn't really have culture. It's just like melting pot of everybody wanting to move there. There's different reasons why you want to be there. Yeah. Best weather in the world. But Florida, if Texas and California had a baby, it'd be Florida. What else do you miss about California? Uh, freeways. I'm a, I love driving. I know all the roads. I don't know all the roads here. I'm still alone. People say, well, we're going to Biscayne. There's a game there. I'm like, where the hell is Biscayne? <laughs> and then you find out. You know, an hour later, Biscayne is pretty far from where we live right now. And hey, you know, you, you got to get at Miramar and you got to go here. You got to go to Weston. You got to go. I still don't know it, but I miss that. I miss my friends. I miss my pastor. I miss my community. I miss the people that I know. But aside from that and the routines I had created, I don't miss the policies. I don't miss the ideas. I don't miss what they stand for, any of that. So, Patrick, you've been around a lot of different kinds of people all your life. I. Uh, your show in particular, uh, the PBD podcast, you've had more communists uh, on your show than any other person. You've had politicians, athletes, comedians, billionaires, but as someone who regularly has such high profile guests, how do you find the balance between asking them tough questions, but maintaining the relationship? That's a good question. So if you disrespect me as a guest, you're opening it up. Mm. And, and that's when it's, you know, you cross the line because what you're telling me is you don't value the relationship. No problem with me. I'm okay with that. We can brawl and have a good conversation together. So, for example, Anthony Winter came in. He disrespected. The moment you disrespect, no problem. Let's have a street fight. It'll be great. I'll get hit. You'll get hit. The audience will win. And then we'll see what happens at the end, right? As a guy that's in debate and your mother and all the things you've done, being in a debate space you know how that works out yeah but i enjoy a good conversation I, I i was raised in a family my mother's side they were big believers of uh, communism 
and my dad's side, they were big believers of imperialism. I've seen some of the best debates with plates flying. I've seen uh, debates with, you know, my dad would buy this nice little piece that they had spent some money from Esfahan. That breaks against the wall. Now, that's entertaining when you're talking about real debate, right? Yeah. Everything else you see after that is going to be more civil and easy. So I'm, I'm very comfortable in chaos. I'm not uncomfortable with it. Mm. But this is disrespect. I'll go here. And as long as I go here and I do it respectfully, and we can somehow, some way get the conversation, and it's your job to know how to maneuver around the questions. Like last yeah. week we had the, Dwayne The Rock Johnson on, on, at our event at the Vol Conference on Palm Beach Convention Center. We had a sellout event, nearly 6,000 people in the room. And him and I talked about a pre-event, and we had a lot of different co conversations together. I said, look, I'm going to ask you tough questions, but you're a pro. You answer the question the way you want. Even if I push back, you're still in charge because you get to say whatever kind of an answer you want to give. Yeah. And when the interview comes out, you'll see. There were some very tense moments, but you'll see how he handled it. So mm. as long as the basis is respect, we can have a great conversation together. Hmm. Do you treat that the same way when you're a guest on someone's show? Meaning if somebody is trying to do a gotcha interview? Yeah, like if someone disrespects you, do you still try to swivel it in a way that you maintain the relationship? Or do you kind of open fight that way? I, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, you have certain chemistry with certain people that you you talk to someone, you're like, mm. I like this guy. You know, even with so like Jenk, Jenk and I can talk, but we fully disagree politically mm. where we're at. But I actually enjoy the conversations with them, yeah. right? Uh, I can sit there and have a conversation with Chris Como. We don't agree with a lot of things politically. Mm. But right after we're done with our podcast, we'll come here and have a cigar and have a conversation. And we're still fighting and arguing because yeah. we still don't agree on a, a lot of things politically. No, I don't mind that. I'm not one where you and I have to agree on 100% of things. But the natural, organic way, like when I was coming up and I was, we made a list. We, we did an exercise one day, me and Mario. Yeah. And I went up there and we had like four or 500,000 subs, smaller to YouTube channel, we're barely coming up. And we make a list. And I said, Mario, I want you to write down all the names on the board here. And I'm going to tell you who long term I would like to have a relationship with and mm. who I have no interest in. So he says, OK, start giving me the name. He starts giving it. This person. That, not a lot of these names you know. That person. This person. Yeah, what else? 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 We're going. We're going. We always talk about this meeting. I said, who do you think are my top 10? Yeah. I said, who do you think is my top five? And I said, let me tell you who I want to build a relationship with long term. Is this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. That's it. Everybody else happens, happens, doesn't happen, doesn't happen. But I'm in pursuit of those five names. Now, yeah. does that mean those five are interested in me? No. There is the risk. When you go up to a girl and you flirt with a girl that you like, what's the likelihood she's going to like you back 100%? Zero. 100% yeah. is not out there, right? But... I would much rather put myself in a position where I get to pursue who I want to be friends with than the other way around. I don't want to be begging. I'm not in a business of um, wanting to convince you, hey, I want to be friends with you. Like even those five names that I put up there, guess what? Two of them didn't want to have a relationship. Hmm. And that's okay. Was Bill Maher one of those names by chance? Not at all. Because I um, saw that show and he came at you pretty strong he did, in the beginning. Yeah. He was asking who you were voting for. Right. He kind of asked your net worth, which right. is a touchy subject with some people. But it seemed as though the whole interview, you were trying to deflect things, kind of take it in a scenario where you guys were still friendly. Maybe you just kind of intuitively do that. No, I was trying to find out what his outcome of doing his own show, because the HBO format he does is very different than a podcast he does. Mm. And then I'm trying to size him up to say, is this therapy for him? Because this is not a real podcast. He spoke 90% of the time. Yeah. So if you want to speak and it's an outlet for you to release whatever tensions you may have, go for it. I'll sit there for two hours and entertain you. But when I watch what he does on HBO where he's like this, sometimes he does some of the best analysis. It's very impressive. But uh, no, I'm in the business of sizing people up to see where they're at and I'll maneuver and say, okay, yeah, this is where you want to go. Let's go. Here's where you're going to go. Great. Hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it was his most commented podcast he's ever done in his life. Hmm. I don't know why. But if you go read the comment section, 20... Two twenty-five thousand comments. He's never had those types of comments. The audience had a different view of it, and they had mm -hmm. a lot of strong opinions about it. But again, who won at the end of the day? The audience did. That's interesting. You have this book, uh, "Choose Your Enemies Wisely." How does that relate to this concept? Um, and what enemies have you chosen? Uh, to which concept? I guess the concept of like being friendly with certain guests. Uh, 
being friendly with certain interviewers, uh, choosing to make an enemy of them for the sake of that podcast? Make an enemy of them for the sake of the podcast. So are you asking uh, sometime when I interview somebody, I want to make him my enemy? Is that what you think? I guess for the sake of the debate. For the sake of the debate. So do you think I try to make Bill Maher an enemy of me or me an Definitely enemy not. of him? No. Okay. I, I'm curious if you ever do do that. And if so, who... Um, well, no, I mean, if you yeah. want to have a lively conversation, okay, if you go look at UFC, yeah, um, uh, 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 Dana White, I love watching his interviews, yeah. post-fight interviews, pre-fight and post-fight. I watch more Dana White interviews post-fight than I watch fights. Yeah. I'll miss a UFC card, but I will not miss his post-fight interview. And one of the times... There was this guy named Tyrone Woodley. I don't know if you follow UFC or not. A little bit, yeah. Okay. So Tyrone Woodley, good-looking guy, mm. incredible physique, incredible fighter. Yeah. Could have been one of the guys that was the face of the UFC. But a couple fights in a row, the way he won, he won by points. And so he would not fight, and it was a boring fight for the audience. Yeah. Horrible, right? But guess what? He got the W. Yeah. What a boring fight. was an exciting, right? So Dana one day comes out and says, look, if this is how you're going to be playing, this is how many punches you had, this is what you're doing. So listen, no, you're no longer going to have main fights. Mm. You're going to be the second. You're not going to be the lead card. Why? You're in a fighting game. So if you want to create content and I want to have a good conversation, what is it going to be? Tell me the seven keys to success. You know, tell me, you know, all these boring stuff. Nobody wants to know that. People want to know unique angles, unique questions. And I think a little bit of tension is healthy and necessary. When my kids and I go out to dinner, let's just say you're sitting next to me, like one of the wait servers that waits on us, yeah. he always wants to hear the conversations at the table with my kids. We're always arguing. We're literally always arguing. Yeah. And my kids are always debating each other. And, and we'll, we'll create a cr environment to that. We'll play a game, and this is what the game is. Uh, I'll sit my sons down, I'll say, okay guys, um, I'm gonna give you guys a, a, an argument to take. Let's see who wins the debate here. What is it? Uh, uh, one is uh, a man lives a better life if he commits to being married and having four kids. And the other one is you have to sell why it's better to stay single and be a playboy the rest of your life, okay? You guys do rock, paper, scissor. Whoever wins gets to choose whichever one they wanna make the argument for. Yeah. So they'll do rock, paper, scissor, boom. Oh my God. You're going to take the married man with four kids. Now I have to play the playboy. You do. Make your argument why it's better to be a playboy. Hmm. But I don't want that. It doesn't matter. You're playing a game. Make the argument. He makes the argument. He makes the argument. He makes the argument. They go back and forth. They go back. And I give points. Yeah. And they mention, who do you think won? I think this one he won. Great. Next one. Next one. Would you rather live on the beach or would you rather live in the forest? Okay. Well, it's better to live on the beach. Make the argument. Okay. Rock, paper, scissors, one. Because I think that, like, the way your mom, you were telling me off camera, the way your mom raised you, the whole debate stuff, I love that. That's why I asked you, what did your mom do before? And you're like, she was just a debate teacher. She was an actress. I think yeah. you were telling me she was an actress. But that's why. Because a part of this world you're in with media, the, the way we get closer to the truth is when ideas clash. Yeah. And if we can't have ideas clash, we just agree, what a boring show we're putting on. No, definitely. Makes sense. I want to transition a bit here. Um kind of around this topic. Why did Shaq block you on Twitter? Mm -hmm. So Shaq blocked me on Instagram. Uh, but so uh, uh, why did Shaq block me on Instagram? So I have Kobe come to our event and we have him at uh, this uh, one uh, event where he's, he's speaking, President Bush is speaking, George Bush is speaking, Billy Bean is speaking. I got 6,000 people at Mirage Las Vegas. He hits the stage and I said, hey, I'm a big Shaq guy. I'm a diehard Shaq guy. The first rookie card I ever got that was worth anything was Shaq's card, Stadium Club. Love that card. Yeah. It's a sick card, beautiful. He's jumping up Orlando Magic jersey. So I said, uh, uh, hey, um, if Shaq had your work ethic, who would he have been? And he would have been the greatest of all time. He would yeah. have been the greatest of all time. And I said, really? If you had your work? Yes. I said, what else? He says, we would have won 10, 11, 12 championship rings if you had my work ethic. Anyways, the next day, Stephen A. Smith responds to that on first take, goes viral. Shaq sees it. He DMs me. What a dumbass question you're asking. Go grow your small little business that you have. Mind your own business. I get blocked. I'm like, okay, here we go. Two and a half years later, a lot of people around him are like, this is a good guy. You should sit down with him and have him interview. Finally, he agrees. I invite him to one of my events at the MGM Grand Arena. We got 10,000 people in the room. 
He says, before we do the interview, I want to see Pat on the back. So I go to the back. He sees me. He says, you know, that was still a dumbass question. I said, I thought it was a great question, Shaq. He said, that's a dumbass question you asked me. Anyways, we sit, we laugh. He hits, you know, my son, really, him and him. My son became very good friends, Dylan. And then when I'm doing the interview, this is the first time. There's people right in front of us. You'll see it in the video. It says, where's Dylan? Where's my buddy Dylan at? Yeah. Dylan, come on up here. And Dylan comes up and Dylan sits right next to me for the entire interview. It's the only interview I've done where Dylan sits next to me the entire time. So, and now we have a relationship. We, at any time, he'll FaceTime Dylan and say, I want to know how Dylan's doing. Let me talk to Dylan. Hey, Dylan, how's school? What's this? What's that? But that's the whole story between a feud with Shaq. Hmm. It's a great story. Um, so he's not still upset about it. No, no. He's he kind of made amends. But you don't want a seven foot, 400 pound guy yeah. who's very strong to be upset at you for too long. You have to find a way <laughs> to create peace. Yeah, for sure. So before you sold PHP or the majority stake in it, um, you bought your house in Fort Lauderdale for what was it, 20.4 million? Mm -hmm. um, which was the largest purchase at the time? Yes. In, was it in Fort Lauderdale or was it in? F I think in Fort Lauderdale, yes. Yeah. But what some people might find more interesting is Messi is your neighbor. Yeah. What's it like having uh, Lionel Messi as a neighbor? I don't think he knows how famous he is. Really? I really don't think he knows how famous he is. <laughs> he goes, walks around like he's a regular guy. Yeah. You know, and there's always people lined up outside of our community where our security, everybody's armed, but they're always lined up. They're either wearing inner Miami jerseys or Argentina jerseys. Yeah. And they're just waiting. And a lot of people get arrested because they try to sneak in. Sometimes boats come in front of their house, you know, and they get arrested. But, uh, you know, like I said, I think he thinks he's a regular guy. Of course, he knows he is in the argument of the greatest of all time. But my kids will, especially Dylan, he'll go and knock on the door, man. He'll knock until they answer the door. So finally, we're at a game. And they said, is that your son? Yes. He says, that's the guy that knocks on the door. Yes. <laughs> we wait till 11 o'clock. Messi comes, says hi to Dylan, and they have their moment together. The video picture was great. But yeah, I, I think, he, he, you know, this guy trick or treats and walks around like he just regular neighbor. That's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. Like he doesn't realize like you're messy. You're not a regular guy. But uh, do you think him and Ronaldo are probably the two most famous people on earth? Because a lot of Americans don't have this concept of soccer or football like how it's treated internationally i think you're right i think you're right i mean obviously if you think about the most liked instagram post of all time mm. i think th three out of the top five is messi i think the other one out of top five is ronaldo and ronaldo the other day chooses to start his youtube channel i don't know if you saw that or not i didn't see that no in a span of a week he went from zero to 55 million subscribers. Wow. Fastest ever. That is the fastest that ever, yeah. He might pass Mr. Beast. Well, that's what he said. He says he wants to get bigger than Mr. Beast, but that Mr. Beast had to work for it to yeah. get there. But Ronaldo is just so famous and so attractive. And, you know, he, he the, the one thing marketing-wise, if somebody was Messi's marketing manager or, you know, CMO or whoever it is, him not speaking English and doing interviews is cost him a lot of, a lot of money. The moment Ronaldo realized he's got to speak English and he started doing interviews, he went to the strap because the sponsorships he gets, it's very different than the sponsorships Messi gets. That makes and my sense. kids, as much as, in my opinion, Messi's the GOAT, not, not when it comes down to my kids. Yeah. Dylan's like, Dad, it's, it's purely Ronaldo. My nephew, it's purely Ronaldo. It's, it's a very, the connection Ronaldo's made with young kids, I think is very different than a connection Messi's made with young mm. kids. I think sense. Messi's connections with older yeah. folks who kind of follow and they, but Ronaldo is, Ronaldo has a younger audience hmm. and the ladies let me put that up <laughs> I think ladies would much rather follow Ronaldo than Messi that makes sense yeah he has that persona yes um, he does I want to skip around here do you gamble on sports personally? oh not at all I can't no? stand it no what's your opinion on uh, sports betting and do you think it's ruining the games I don't think so. I, I think uh, I'm not a fan of it myself. Uh, one of my friends uh, was almost killed because he was a major gambler. And I remember the guy that he couldn't pay off. And by the way, fun fact, which is very crazy. Yeah. It was a team Toledo that hmm. was playing. And the reason why I say Toledo is because, you know, it was a no-namer. Yeah. So Toledo is playing against a team. And I think they were supposed to lose by 42 points. Mm. And he bets for Toledo to lose less than 42 points and they end up losing by like 45 points. Yeah. So he's like, there's no way. And he put his entire life savings that he had and they were after him. It was ugly. We had to find a way to make that work out. I'm not a fan of that. I used to gamble a lot. I used to play poker a lot. I used to play blackjack a lot. I was in Vegas 26 years, 26 mm -hmm. times a year. 
And I was heavy, heavy gambler. And then one day I'm like, yeah, I'm done. I don't want to do any of this stuff. What and, was it uh, for you? So two of them. When I was a kid, when I was 11 years old, living in Germany, my mom and my sister and I, we bought five uh, lottery tickets, five, five marks we put. We picked the numbers. I said, this is it. We're going to be millionaires. It was like five million bucks. I said, this is it. We're going to be done permanently. We're going to be rich. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. I'm sitting waiting for the numbers to come out. Uh, we got, I think, four out of six or three out of five numbers right. So it was still like a pretty exciting pretty experience. Good, yeah. We lost it. I cried like a little baby. I said, I will never play lottery. It's so the last time I ever played lotto mm -hmm. when I was 11 years old. And then the other time was I was in Vegas once. And I went out. I'm 21 years old. I took out $5,000 of my MBNA credit card. It allowed me to take $5,000 of cash out. And I said, I'm going to go there and I'm going to bet $250. If I lose, I'll go 500. If I lose, I'll go 1,000. If yeah. I lose, I'll go. So I did that. I bet 250, I lost. I bet 500, I lost. I bet 1,000, I lost. I bet the other 2,500, I lost. Six hands in a row, I lost. I said, there's no way this is supposed to be happening. It's the last time I played. I'm like, I'm wow. And uh, that next day, I get a call from a guy named Dave Kirby. I got an offer to work at Morgan Stanley Dean Witter, and I never played the game ever again. Just hmm. walked away from it. It's better to... Uh have a bad taste in your mouth with it when you don't have a lot of money, you know? Because yeah, but listen, I gamble with business. Mm. I take risks in business because, you know, I'm at least controlling it. Yeah. You know, I'm the house. I'm the guy that's the operator. I'm controlling the odds, the energy, the intensity. But you don't when you're playing, you know, in the casino. Yeah. I mean, the odds of a business winning is pretty much zero, but you only have to win one time. You know, that's the and, main and, difference. And it's predicated on who's the operator, right? Mm -hmm. Think about who the operator is. If if I told you right now, uh, you know, Elon Musk is starting a business, okay? And he's going to go into the phone business. He's raising a billion dollars. Yeah. He thinks he's going to have a, you know, half a billion dollar company. And you get to put $100,000 into it. If it goes to $100 billion, your $100,000 is $10 million. Would you consider putting a hundred thousand dollars? So, yeah. You would say because of the operator. So, so business and investment, the risk is all relied on who the operator is. If the operator has a reputation, who's a driver, who's not driven by money, who's driven by correcting an injustice or doing something that's never been done before, you can play ball. Mm -hmm. If the operator is distracted, you know, coming from a place of just, then you're like, I'm not going to take the risk. So, the, the key to the business is who the operator is. Before we transition a bit into politics, um, I wanna ask you this, and this has kind of been a topic of discussion uh, among people on X. So I've had some conspiratorial guests on the podcast, uh, particularly my last guest claims that politics is slavery with the illusion of freedom, the illusion of choice. Um, and a lot of people make the claim that once someone gets elected into office, the people in the black suits, the people in the three-letter agencies uh, kind of have control. They tell them who's boss. But why are you pro-Trump with that concept in mind? Do you not believe in that concept? Do you think it's only um, a small part of the equation? How old are you? 23. What do you think? Hmm. <sighs> I think the president likely has some degree of power or at least implied power to other countries, but I think it would be unlikely that he has as much power as people th might think he does. Very interesting. So you subscribe to a somewhat of a, uh, a philosophy of what your previous guest believes in? I would say so, yes. Okay, great. So, um, but I'm I'm open to it. I right? totally get it. And, yeah. and by the way, I, I applaud you for being open to it and being reasonable to it. But for me, here's how I see it. Right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So, is, is that your girlfriend or is, is yes. okay? How long have you guys been together? Uh, well, seven months. Eight months. Seven months. Is it pretty serious? Yeah. Okay. Do you think she has any selfish reasons of wanting to be with you? Of course. Yeah. Do you? Yeah. Of course. Is there anything wrong with that? No. Nothing wrong with that, right? Okay. Do you think um, uh, when, let's just say one day you guys get married, okay, yeah. and you guys have kids, do you think for the first 90 days or a year or two years when your kids are born, who do you think is more important to her day to day when she wakes up in the morning? Who do you think she's thinking about first? Definitely the kids, yeah. Do you think there's anything wrong with that? No. So that's the natural part, right? Mm -hmm. I remember one time 
uh, my wife is pregnant with our first. Yeah. This is 2012 um, and 2011. And we're sitting outside our house in Northridge, California, off of Encino Avenue. And it's one lady who was a cashier at, uh, 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 what is that, uh, Bed Bath & Beyond. We helped her roll over some of her money. One of our ladies that Diana did, and she's walking by our house, and she sees her. We're just sitting outside. It's a Sunday. She says, oh, hi, Jen. Hi, Patrick. Hey, how's everything? Good. So when do you do? February 1st. Can I give you some unsolicited advice? Yeah, sure. What's up? Says, when, when um, you know, Patrick, let me start off with you. When she has the baby, yeah. you're going to go through a moment where you're going to possibly consider making a dumb mistake. Because you're going to feel like the kid is more important than you. Your needs are not being met. You get no attention. Nothing's been happened to you. You're going to be frustrated. You're going to be sexually frustrated. This lady's just talking to me. I don't know this lady. Yeah. She's just a cashier at Bed Bath & Beyond. She's like, so I'm going to be sexually frustrated. You're going to be sexually <laughs> frustrated. I'm like, all right. What else? Miss psychologist know it all, right? <laughs> and then she says, you're going to go through it. And you guys are going to have a big fight. Okay. When that happens... Just know it's very normal. We all go through it. And I'm like, then she looks at my wife. She says, now, Jen, I got some advice for you. I'm like, let me see what she's going to say to her. She says, when you have the kid and a baby's born and your body's going to be acting weird and you're tired, you have no sleep, you're waking up three, four, five times a night, you're, you're frustrated, you have zero energy, you're just not feeling like doing anything, you still have to find a way to please your husband. Yeah. She became my hero when she said that. But do you understand what she's saying? Yeah. So guess what happened? Baby's born. We have our fight. And it's a bad fight. I said, babe, just remember what that lady said. She's right. Okay. Now, obviously, we, we laugh about it now. But guess what? When you're married and you have kids for the first time, who tells you stuff like this? You don't know. There's not like a manual you go through. Maybe your mom tells you. Maybe your dad tells you. But most of the time, they don't give you a manual of what you're going to go through. And so you screw up yeah. trying to learn. Okay. What's my point here? Trump, do you think he has some selfish reasons for wanting to be president? A lot less than previous candidates, perhaps. I don't disagree, but do you think he has some? Of course, yeah. Do you think he's super competitive? Of course. Do you think he's a deal maker? Yeah. Do you think when he's asking money from, uh, you know, the Walton family that gives him a hundred, not the Walton family, the Adelson family who uh, uh, bought the, uh, uh, the uh, Dallas Mavericks, and she gives $100 million, give or take, at one of these uh, uh, packs, super packs. Do you think he knows that she may want something later on? Definitely. Maybe, okay? Do you think when he does a deal and he has to sit there and say, okay, I got to choose between Israel, Palestine, you, Ukraine, Russia, you know, how am I going to make my deal with China, tariffs? How do I deal with, you, you know, Peter Thiel, he's a smart guy, I want to bring him in. Peter Thiel likes J.D. Vance, my son likes J.D. Vance. You know, my daughter's not going to be involved in this one with Jared Kushner, but who do I bring in? If they're not going to be involved, man, who's going to play a role? You know, what's my younger son going to play a role to see Baron Trump? Is he going to bring some of the younger guys that are going to want to do this? My wife, what role does she... He's a deal maker, yeah. okay? So, yes, when you make deals, you sometimes owe favors, okay? So I think that dirty part of politics he's learned how to play it more this time around do i still think there's people behind closed doors that are the puppet masters that are controlling what to do what not to do and certain people they control i think those people are still there do i think those people are going to make the calls and give threats and say if you don't do this we're going to do this i think those things are there but here's the reality okay what what dirt do you now have on Trump that the public doesn't know about? What are you going to say? I'm going to tell the world about Stormy Daniels. They know. I'm going to tell the world about Kira McDougal. They know. I'm going to have the DOJ come after you and tell you mar lago is only worth $18 million. I just went through it. I'm going to send people to come and investigate your mar lago property and go through your wife's drawers, panties, and all this stuff, and we're going to go look for the files. They've already done it. I'm going to humiliate you publicly. It's already happened. So I think Trump is in a position right now where from the first term, he experienced that, where he, you know, tried to get some things done, but he's like, oh, I don't know if I can get things done. He saw what happened second term, where he lost, and, you know, in, in election interference, et cetera, all that stuff that happened. He saw the dark side of it, the game. And now this time around, he's coming. He has an experience. Who to bring in, who not to bring in, who to have, who not to have. So, but does that mean the 
people that come in from those three-letter organizations still don't have a lot of control? No, they still have control. Uh, how you Do you think with, they have more control? Absolutely, because they're going to be there longer. You're not going to be there longer. They, they like Nancy Pelosi, when he first got into office, like, look, guys, all these guys can come and go. They're going to be here four years, max eight years. We're going to be here forever. Don't worry about it. We got this. Let us stay unified. Forget about these guys. They're the face. We run the show. Who told, who fired Joe Biden? Who sat Joe Biden down and fired Joe Biden? Nancy Pelosi. Can you imagine the amount of power she has to sit him down and say, you're out? Yeah. What did that conversation sound like? Do you think there were any threats involved? Do you think there were some deals involved? You think maybe she said to him, if you do this deal, what I'm going to do to you is we're going to get you a nice little documentary about you and we're going to give you the best library and we'll get the funding for this and we're going to make you seem like this and we're going to make you seem like the hero and we're going to make the comparisons of George Clooney or talking about the fact that you're the, one of the most noble presidents of all time compared to George Washington. That's what George Clooney said. Yeah. That was all dealt. But they also said, if you don't step away, let me tell you what we're going to do. We're going to double down on this. We're going to double down on that. And we're going to double down on this. You don't think they said that behind closed doors? Of course they did. That happened. Why? Because she has more power than Joe Biden does. Those types of people are the real people that have the power that are not going to be presidents. But they're the bosses behind closed doors. You talk to Michael Francis, but there are certain people in the mob that are more powerful than the face that you never hear about. When those people knock, the, knock on the door, you have to answer because they can, they can destroy your life. He knows that. I think a lot of people um, are developing apathy to politics because of this concept. But do you still think that Trump or perhaps Kamala, do you think they hold enough power or influence or the election itself holds enough power and influence to where people should pay attention to politics? You know, one of my favorite quotes, I don't know if Plato said it or Socrates, one of these two guys said it, is uh, uh, those who don't study politics will be, f will be led by fools who do. Yeah. Those who don't study politics will be led by fools who do. Uh, I could care less about politics because when I was a kid, my parents got two divorces because of politics. I hate politics. But when I got into business and I saw how much politics was involved in business and I realized the gamification behind closed doors, the manipulation, I said, no, you got to pay attention to this. The first time I realized this was happening is when I bought the book, uh, 33 Strategies of War, yeah. and I listened to it on repeat in my car for two years straight. It's all I listen to over and over and over. People would sit in my car, they're like, what is wrong with this guy? Is this all you listen to? So it's all like two years. Oh, because I knew going into the insurance industry as a guy with no degree, I'm not part of no cliques. I'm not white, I'm Middle Eastern. I'm not saying sympathize for me, but I know I'm not part of a group. Yeah. If I'm going in to take market share and compete, they're going to hate me. So I had to learn all the games, understand what they're gonna do to me, and know what maneuvers I was going to make and be 5, 10, 15, 20 steps ahead, hopefully, there was no way in the world that we're going to let me build a business and sell it for as much as we did. That does not happen in the insurance business, especially in the marketing organization side. You rarely hear a company sell for as much as we sold it for, especially in that short period of time. It's not like I'm 65 years old. I've been doing this for 45 years, right? So I had to understand that game. And in politics, very similar, except it's worse. Hmm. It's dark. It's dirty. It's nasty. Uh, but uh, if you if you choose not to study politics and you're just kind of like, oh, I don't give a shit what they do, well, you will pay price for it long term. You will pay price, especially if you're planning on making wealth, moving up, getting to a position where you can be financially free, taking care of your wife, your kids, your parents. If you don't pay attention to politics, economy, taxes, because I think all of that is together, yeah. you'll pay price for it. So you think it's mostly unuseful to people who aren't involved in business, but you are under the assumption, as well as I am, that most people should be involved in some sort of business. Oh, I mean, if you're planning on growing in mm -hmm. life and taking care of yourself financially long-term for you, your wife, your husband, your kids, this doesn't mean you're trying to be a millionaire or a billionaire. Even if you're trying to make enough money to take care of yourself, support yourself, and then find out what they're doing at public schools with kids, with different people. You have to see, where am I going to raise my kids? Where am I going to live? What am I going to... You have to be paying attention to all that stuff. So we had another Trump assassination attempt. You'd kind of tweeted that we're kind of used to this. Why do you think we're used to Trump almost getting assassinated? 
Just look at the reaction. It wasn't like the craziest trending topic yesterday. I didn't even know about it until I went to your Twitter. That's crazy. I know. <laughs> it was like, yeah, just happened. And then people on the left was like, yeah, because he's attracting it. It's him. Really? You, you, he's saying you guys are the biggest threat to our democracy. Uh, no one on the left is saying Trump's the biggest threat to democracy. So what do you think you keep saying he's the biggest threat to democracy? So it's kind of like if a mother keeps telling her son a thousand times, your husband, your father can one day hurt your mother, maybe one out of 10,000 sons who doesn't like the father because of the amount of BS the mother's fed the son, maybe one of the 10,000 sons would be willing to do something to hurt the father to be the hero in front of the mother. Hmm. The mother's in charge of how the son treats the father. Yeah. And, and some mothers say the husband cheated on her, say the husband left her dry with no money, say the husband left one day. That pain, some handle it in different ways. Some go to church, some seek vengeance, some find a way to get their revenge with their pinning their kids against them. But maybe the average son's gonna be like, oh mom, leave it alone. I'm like, it's enough. I know you hate it. That's your problem between you and him. Maybe, you know, a hundred out of a hundred kids don't do anything about it. But one out of 10,000 is all it takes. One out of 100,000 is all it takes. So far, we've had two. And this is a very interesting guy that did this, by the way. A lot of people, if you go follow him and, and look at some of the things, something came up by the fact that he was following this one girl named Sue Kim, and uh, who she was a former ex-CIA, okay? And she had some responsibilities with different organizations. I think she's a Yale person. He followed her, which is not a big deal. You can follow anybody. But she followed him. Yeah. Why did she follow him? Why, why did he go to Ukraine wanting to fight? Why does he have his weird background with the stuff that he's done, Hawaii, and, you know, you had weapons of mass. We had certain weapons 22 years ago or 20 years ago and certain weird arrests. And your son is being interviewed and say, yeah, my father hated Trump, but he would have never killed him. I mean, and then, by the way, Trump decided last minute to go golf. It wasn't scheduled weeks in advance. You decide last minute to go golf, and then you're there lined up knowing he's going to be there. Who fed you the information? Hmm. Who told you he's going to be there? I just have a lot of questions, and I don't know if these types of questions are like flipping like this, you know, where you're like, hey, here's what we found out. Boom, 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 boom. It's not moving quickly enough. But, um, you know, Trump's not going to change his position. He's going to keep campaigning. He's not going to sit on the sidelines. But uh, yeah, I think, I think there's a community that's becoming a little bit too immune to this. And um, it doesn't mean there's not gonna be another one and another one and another one. Maybe they'll Do continue. Do you think there'll be another one? Oh, I mean, the way they're going right now, they're, they, they fear, you know, Vinny and I were talking, Vinny put a very good tweet up, Vincent Oshana put a great tweet up where he said, uh, the first debate happens with uh, uh, President Biden. How many days later was the assassination attempt? So they didn't succeed. Now debate happens with Kamala. Mm. Kamala immediately wants to do a, uh, a, a second debate, a rematch. And then news leaks that on ABC there was an agreement made that you get to ask these questions and fact check only Trump and not the others. And I think ABC even said, yeah, that's kind of what took place. You can do your own due diligence and look this up. And then a few days later, there's another one. The, again, no one's saying that's, you know, let's correlate all of this that there is something like a deeper thing going on but when i run a business and i'm sitting in a room and we're trying to find out why our server keeps going down on the last day of the month in the last two hours i have to go out there and pull up the data and find out what's ha what happens on the last day of the month in the last two hours and what certain state or what certain city the traffic comes in the most to be able to isolate which office it is. Are they messing around? Are we getting attacked? It's a competitor. I want to know everything. Yeah. And then you're like, there's a 3% chance we're being attacked by an enemy. There's a 28% chance that it's our top office that's competing harder than the others. There's, a, But I want all of it. That doesn't mean each, each, each one of them. I just want to be able to sit there and say, okay, boom, boom. As a general of the army, as a leader, you get to decipher and say, uh, it's probably this, but let's investigate all of it. That's what our job is, but we're not doing that. Hmm. It's really interesting that when you do investigate this, it comes up with similar answers. Like the profile of the last shooter was somewhat similar right. in nature. Yeah, so uh, guys, look out after the next debate, I suppose, um, especially Trump. If he does it, he's even said he does want to do it, including if it's Fox News and, 
uh, uh, you know, Brett Bear and all these other guys. Like, he just doesn't want to do another debate. He's like, I'm done. He says, anytime in, in a boxing match when somebody fights their opponent and they win, it's always the loser that wants a rematch. He says, I don't want a rematch. She wants a rematch. It's interesting the way he, he's one of the best power player trollers in a market ever. The guy is one of one. Who do you think won the debate, Trump or Kamala? I think Kamala did much better than people thought she was going to. I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, I think Kamala came out. Uh, she, her abortion argument uh, to, you know, uh, uh, suburban women, the way she presented it. And it's a big percentage of America was not happy about what happened with Roe v. Wade uh, right before the midterm. So that kind of was her point. And I think Trump was just thinking he's going to come and crush it. And he's like, who is this girl? She's, she's not on my level. Yeah. It's almost like Michael Jordan's playing against a high school basketball player. And you're like, oh, I don't need to practice and prepare for this. You play in high school. You're not at my level. Yeah. You know, and but every once in a while, you like Michael Jordan, one time they're playing against the Knicks and they're like, oh, Bulls are going to sweep these guys. First game, Knicks come and they beat the Bulls. And after the game, Michael's being interviewed. Again, I love post-game interviews. Michael says, if you think we were going to come here and beat the Knicks and sweep them, that, that's not the case. These guys are formidable. And it went, ended up going to game seven. And they barely won four to three. Yeah. Super close. Anytime you hit the debate stage, whether you're right that you are more formidable than the other person. But if that person was chosen as a presidential candidate across the aisle from you, you have to take that opponent seriously. I don't think that happened. I think he had a lot of opportunities to bring up certain things. He didn't bring them up. Yeah, of course. It seems ABC. kind of repetitive. Yeah, I, ju I just think he came in like, I got this. I'm going to do the greatest hits. It's going to be done. And then at the end, she rattled them by saying a few things. You know, if you want to go to uh, go to Trump's event, see what happens. People walk out. A lot of people walk out. Ooh, that. You're poking a bear. He doesn't like that yeah. when you say stuff like that. Um, and she got under his skin better than he got under her skin because he said her father was a Marxist. He raised her to be a Marxist. You look at her face. She didn't get upset. So she seemed like she had that. You know, certain women, you know, some people have an aunt like this, you know, where you try to get under their skin, they can't, but they know how to backfire and do it to you. And they're just so full of themselves that they know how to do that. It is a skill set. She has it, but Trump's a fighter. Yeah, Trump's a fighter and she was able to get under her skin. But at the end of the day, it doesn't mean anything if you're winning Democrats, you already have Democrats. It doesn't mean anything if you want MAGA voters. What matters is when they asked her questions about the economy, she couldn't answer. She was interviewed yesterday. Most people don't even talk about this. It was a, a local ABC guy that interviewed. He asked her a question. says, can you tell me two things about the economy? How are you going to fix the economy? Two things. I don't know if you've seen this yet or not. You have enough. to see this. She, she tells a story about the lawn. And you listen to this like, I cannot believe this was the answer. She knows nothing about the economy. When I tell you nothing, she knows nothing about the economy based on how she answers this question. You're not going to fool independents and libertarians. They know the economy matters. So when the next day the stock market futures drop because they're worried that she may have a chance of winning, what are futures? Futures, right? Yeah. When it drops? No, this is not an economy person. And independents, they rely a lot on how your policies are going to affect the economy. Do you think America is ready for a female president? Do I think America is ready for a female president? I think so. I don't think it's a, I asked this question two nights ago for my son. Uh, my son's during dinner. And uh, my son's like, yeah, sure. But it depends policies, dad. You know, we don't care if it's a female president. You just have to have the right policies. And I agree with them. I think we are. But here's a question you got to ask yourself. So this is a question I asked them. I said, which would you rather have? Would you rather have a... Um, a 35-year-old single president, male, who's never had kids, is not married, or an 85-year-old man who is married with kids, which would you rather take? The married. Yeah. So, so that's right. Now, he says, now my son responds, and he says, well, it depends. I said, depends on what? Is the 85-year-old a healthy 85-year-old? That's actually a very good question you're asking, right? So then I said, okay, so do you think somebody who has never been a general, never been in a military should be able to serve as a president? David, my uh, uh, security guy, says it depends on timing. 
He says, I think today we would benefit from having a president that's been in the military before because we're in wartime. Ukraine, Russia, Israel, Hamas, Palestine. That's actually a very interesting perspective. I said, what are you more uncomfortable with? A person who's never served the military to be your president or a person who's never had a child to be your president? Hmm. So the audience has to make that decision. Like, ah, I'm probably going to choose somebody that's never had, because if you've never had kids, how do you know what it's like to raise kids? Well, Kamala's never had kids. Yeah. So, you know, we have to sit there and think for ourselves, well, who cares? Why are you asking a sexist question like that's not a sexist question she's never had kids are you okay with some well she's got a step step totally get it but you you've never had a child so mm -hmm. i want her to have the experience of what it is to do that yeah now so if we get somebody who is a qualified woman that maybe you know married had kids. now by the way if you can't have kids different story we can't judge a person if you can't have kids but if you chose not to have kids why did you choose not to have kids? Well, it's because I chose my career over everything else. No matter what you do, somehow, some way back here, when you make decisions, you will not be thinking about the people that chose to have kids because it's not that important to you, right? When I was building my insurance company, I'll never forget what I had to learn. I was single and I'm building the business and I was 25 years old and I was working with individuals that were married with kids. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, you got to do this and you got to do this and you got to do this. You got to do this. They're like, oh, wait till you have kids and you're married. You won't think like this. Mm. I'm like, man, this is, but I'm still going to be like this. No, you're not. Okay. So then I started one day. I'll never forget. I, I took uh, 12 couples to Foga de Chao. In, love that place. Love yeah, that place. Yeah, yeah. At, in Universal uh, City. Do you know Universal City? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know where that is? I took them there. So we went there and I sat there. And I put husband and wife, husband and wife, husband and wife, all the men on one side, all the ladies on one side. And I had them all talk to each other. Hmm. For two and a half hours, they didn't talk to me. I sat in a corner and I just listened to all the stresses and worries that mothers have, hmm. husbands have, fathers have, wives have. And I'm writing it down. Got it. Boom. Got it. Boom. Got it. Boom. Got it. So then every time I'm sitting down with a husband and wife, I'm single 25. I don't know what it is to be married with kids. Yeah. What's, the, what's the biggest pressure of being married? What is the biggest challenge of uh, being a mother and a father and trying to make a business work? What is this? So then when I'm speaking to a crowd or an audience, I now know what is the pain point of being a mother, trying to make your marriage work and trying to cook for your husband or trying to get your career going. If you got a dual income, you're working, he's working, picking up the kids, waking up early, making breakfast, going to work, not being late, not losing your job. It's a hard thing to do, right? So and then later on when I got married and I had kids, and I said, wait, you have your second. I'm married with two kids. I'm still driving. Yeah, but it's boys. You never had a girl. You're, you're going to change when you have a girl. I had a girl. Yeah. And then they, they couldn't say anything because now we got two boys and two girls. But then I understood what it was like to be married with kids. So there, there is a very, very, I was interviewing uh, uh, Hunter Biden's ex who had a kid with him. The recent one that they didn't want to talk about publicly and Joe Biden didn't want to talk about. Yeah. While I had her on, you know, this is when he was going through a lot of drugs and sometimes they would do it together. She wrote a book that was coming out and she came to me. I was one of the first podcasts. I think that was the first podcast she did. Mm. I said, so tell me, did you ever meet Joe Biden? He says, yes. He says, one day I'm at the hotel and we're fooling around, we're doing drugs and we're having a good time. He says, someone knocks on the door and he says, Hunter goes to the door and he opens the door, it's his father. I said, what happened? He says, well, I came to the side and I was looking at his father. I said, what did you notice? So well, Hunter was high as a kite. I said, what did you feel? He says, I looked at Joe's eyes and I've never seen this much pain in a father. Mm -hmm. You can say whatever you want about Joe Biden. Yeah. He's a father. You can say he's a bad father. Totally your ability. You can say Trump's a bad father, Trump's a bad husband, whatever you want to say. You can say that and have that opinion, but only a father will know what kind of a pain you would go through if that's your son and you're seeing your son go through that pain. You don't want to see your son go through that. Kamala is never going to understand that real feeling because yeah. she hasn't gone through it. Just like a person who becomes a president who's never been in the military, doesn't know what it's like to wake up in a morning formation. 
doesn't know what it's like to go out there and work, doesn't know what it's like to be trained to be a shooter in the military, doesn't know what it's like to go through boot camp, AIT, working in a unit, the language, what it's like, why, it's, why do we stop when we see a four-star general? What kind of respect do we have when we see a general's star on a Humvee and they're driving around everybody, oh my God, it's a, I'm a general's driver. They don't understand that, right? This is a very different language. So one has to sit there and choose what kind of a president we're more comfortable having. In this instance, you know, Americans have to decide, are you comfortable having somebody that wants to be a president who claimed she worked at you know McDonald's, but she never did, who claimed she used to listen to Tupac when she was going to college and she would smoke weed pre-Tupac making any kind of music. And uh, if you want somebody to change their accent because they're speaking to a black audience or you know white audience and to try to find a way to manipulate you, just like when Hillary Clinton went on The Breakfast Club and said, I always carry hot sauce with me. Mm. If, you, if you look at my community as if I'm dumb and you, you, you talk, you're patronizing me, I'm not okay with that. But if that community, even with knowing that, you still vote that way, that then means Democrats own your community. You're owned by them. And you have to be okay with that because you're choosing to do that. But they're looking at you thinking you're oblivious and you don't pay attention to these signs. One has to look at that and say, I'm not a dummy. You're not going to do that to me. You know, it's like flattery, right? Somebody flatters you. When you're younger, it could work. Yeah. A girl who's 18 years old, is it easier to flatter an 18-year-old girl who's never had a boyfriend or a 25-year-old girl who's had two boyfriends and have had a bunch of people flirt with them or a 30-year-old woman or a 40-year-old woman? What's easier to flatter? Probably an 18-year-old, right? If you're a businessman or you're somebody who is in the competitive space, hmm. if you fall for flattery, there's a insecurity inside of you. Yeah. So if voters fall for that flattery it's a form of ignorance and lack of paying attention to details knowing that other person is manipulating you yeah. you're falling for that trap but again voters have to make that decision for themselves i want to touch on something you said so as a veteran um so i went to romania to interview the tate brothers and we took a trip to croatia with a few of my friends and one of them was in the idf right and it was a guy i just met him that time for the first uh, when we went to Croatia and I was telling him about the Tate interview and how Tate had said that maybe there's a world where women shouldn't vote. But then he kind of claimed um, it was because of the military and the capacity for being able to be drafted. Uh, so I asked this friend, I was like, do you think women should vote being in the IDF? And he's like, of course. And I was like, but what if women weren't required to serve in the IDF? Would you think about this differently? And he's like, maybe I would because all the men are being drafted. They have to serve uh, their time but do you think people who were not in the military should be able to vote? So I have a whole breakdown on this that's gonna piss a lot of people off. So for me, when it comes down to voting, I believe in earning the right to vote. For example, if a 16-year-old kid has a job, he's making $20,000 a year, yeah. paying 15% in taxes, $3,000 a year, versus a 28-year-old grown man yeah. who lives with mommy and daddy, has never worked a day in his life, has never paid taxes for income, never held the job, I don't want this 28-year-old to vote. I want the 16-year-old to vote. Mm. To me, it's not about age. It's about understanding the pain of paying taxes. Okay, so now let's go through it. What if there was a system where your vote counts as five votes? What do you mean? Let's go through a scoring system. If... You Do you own any stocks? Yeah. Give me one of the companies you own stock in. Tesla. Tesla. Yeah. How much of a voice do you have in Tesla if you're not happy with something Elon's doing? Very little. Why? I don't own a lot of the company. Now, who does? Elon. Who else does? Probably BlackRock. <laughs> who else does? Uh, George Soros. Larry Ellison. Some yeah. of these guys that, that have put some money into it, right? Or shareholders or, or uh, people that are on the board because they have a bigger say. Who are you and I? Yeah. If we own a few shares, let's just say we have a million dollars of Tesla stock or $100,000 or $10,000, who are you? Hmm. Who am I to say what Tesla should be doing? Yeah, I have some say, but not at the level of somebody's going to be taking it, right? Okay. Yeah. So what if our voting system was like this? You serve the military for four years, you get one additional vote. Hmm. You go become a cop, firefighter for 10 years, you get one additional vote. You're married 
after being married, you have a kid and you guys don't take any money from the U.S. government and you guys stay married for 10 years, per each kid you have, you get one additional vote. Hmm. What if you start a business and you risk all your life savings, you start a business and you create 10 jobs in your local community and these 10 jobs stay actively with you for five years? What if you're limited at five additional votes? What if there was a system, and by the way, no one's going to agree to this. Yeah. And nobody would ever agree to this because the left would be, their ideas would be gone. The socialist philosophies of it's entitlement. It's the opposite it of would, affirmative, it is affirmative the action. Yeah. opposite. If I ever ran a country, that's how I would run the country. You know what would happen in my country? A lot of people wouldn't want to live in my country. You wouldn't want to live there. And I would be totally okay with that because we're not trying to get everybody. Uh, sometimes in life, when you get to a point that you want to win everybody over, like mm. right now, you know what's happening right now? How many subscribers do you have? You have 3 million subscribers, yeah. right? How many YouTube channels have 3 million subscribers? Not many, okay? It's hard to get 3 million subscribers. How old are you? 23. At 23, you have 3 million subscribers. Where do you think you're going to be at 30 years old? I mean, the amount of influence you're going to have by 30, God knows where it's going to be, right? Okay. Mm. So, um, how hard is it to get to 3 million? It's really easy to get from a million to three million. It's really hard to get to that first million. How hard is it? How hard did you work? I mean, I really started doing YouTube when I was 11 or 12. Um, but I'd say when it was serious after blowing up on TikTok, maybe it took me a year to get to a million. How many of your friends from high school have three million subscribers? Zero. How many of your friends from college have three million subscribers? Zero. Okay. How many friends, how many kids have you gone to school with from zero to 18 and in college? How many total people have you interacted with from zero to 22 years old? Interacted with? That you knew. I'm not talking Maybe you a few to thousand. A few thousand. How is it possible out of a few thousand people, none of them have 3 million subscribers plus? Because it's hard. Hmm. This is not easy to do. A lot, how many people you know from zero to 22 years old that started their own YouTube channels? A few. Yeah. Okay. So the starting, then growing, then building. Yeah, I, I think at some point, now you'll do a, sometimes what will happen in life as well, you have to be very careful with this. Mobs will control you. And what do I mean by that? Sometimes you'll talk about something and a community, well, I agree with you. Dad, you, that's right. You're saying the right thing. And you're like, whoa. And you get invited to a party, you're like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I don't agree with you guys. Yeah. What am I doing being here, right? I'm an insurance company and I'm coming up. This is not mine. This is when I'm in one. And I become a position in the company called CEO at the time. They, they had different positions and then it's vice chairman, all this stuff. But at this time I had CEO. This one, nine, one man named Monty makes me the host of one of the events. There's like 3,500 people. I'm the host. So I'm up there, I bring up Mary Lou Retton, Chris Gardner, and I'm like, oh, wow, this guy believes in me. I'm going into my first CEO session. He says, Pat, whatever you do, do you trust me? I said, yes. Hmm. He says, don't go into this meeting. You'll be disappointed. I said, it's my first CEO meeting. Of course I'm going to go. I've been looking forward. He says, I'm telling you, don't go to it. I said, I'm going to it. He says, you're going to realize, don't go to it. So I'm trying to see if this guy's testing me or not. So I go to it. I walk in. Oh, my God. All I hear is, 60% of the men I looked up to, all they're doing is bitching and whining, mm. complaining. This is not fair. That is not fair. This is not fair. I'm like, man, I looked up to you. Look at the way you speak, your language. You sound like a bunch of helpless complainers. Yeah. I don't respect the way these guys are speaking. I don't respect the way you're handling your situation. What is this all about? You don't talk like that. And then I got in and then I realized, okay, at every level, there's complainers. At every level, there's a group of people that are not willing to pay the price to get to the next level. I'm going to do my part to get to the next level. I'm not worried about it. Then a group of all our CEOs, there were 60 CEOs in the room, 56 to be exact. So 56 in the room. And these eight CEOs that I looked up to, we went to the corner with them. And I'm like, hey, what's up? And all of a sudden, I'm catching all of them are bitching and complaining. And I'm like, whoa, I'm not part of this group. So I left. I went to the next group. 
All they're talking about is what bar they're going that night to get drunk. I'm like, I'm good. I don't need to do that. One guy's inviting everybody to go to a strip club. I've been to way too many. When I was in the army, I got out of my system very early on in my life. I don't need to go any of this stuff. Where are you guys going? Hey, we're going to have a strategy session dinner, and we're going to go talk about how we can X, Y, Z to kill everybody here in the business and compete. I'm like, you guys are speaking out my language. And I went with them. You have to be very careful which mob you get recruited to because if you go here, stay here long enough, you'll be part of them. If I ever ran a nation or a country, and if you came to our country com complaining, you're going to have a very hard time being in that type of a community. But my voting system is all based on earning the right to vote. You contribute more, you have more say. It's an interesting one. Um, oh, trust me, most people don't like it. Yeah, so I wanted to relate this to myself a bit, uh, just to kind of get an idea of the way you think about business. I uh, Having interviewed so many high performers and kind of starting your podcast ground up, what is the process or sequence, uh, a word you're very big on and like a system you're big on, how do you become the number one podcaster? Quick note, so I asked Patrick this because I like to figure out how to be number one in a niche as fast as possible. In high school, I was a national speech and debate champion at 16. At 19, I was the number one crime TikToker. And in the past two months since we've launched this podcast, we've already had some of the best guests in the world. But if you're a business owner that wants to be the best in their niche, not number three, not number two, Number one, I actually work with a handful of people every year on this to take them to that level. And if you want to claim your spot and get a chance to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, just DM me the phrase number one on Instagram. DM me the phrase number one. Now let's hear Patrick's answer. How do you become the number one podcaster? So uh, are you saying like period, like a Rogan? Is that kind of where you're going? I would going? say so. Like okay, number so one on Spotify. Well, let's how would you go, go through that. It? Let's go through uh, on how to become the number one podcaster in the world like Rogan. So with Rogan, there's a couple things he has. One, the most boring podcasters, you notice, they are very limited. Okay? Meaning they don't have a lot of width of topics they can talk on and they don't have a lot of depth mm. so it looks like this maybe they can talk three topics and two levels down yeah then you have certain people that are only one topic but nine layers down history military like a balan if you see balan doing interviews i don't know if you've seen balan's podcast or youtube channel he's got like six seven million subscribers Trump, mr balan yeah mr balan yeah, he's, he's a good friend of mine he's, yeah, he's yeah, fantastic yeah, yeah. i love mr he's phenomenal he was wow. the person that mentored me on this whole thing is way he back. not the is he not the coolest cat out there? he's super nice he's super have nice, you had right? him on the show uh, he, he, him and i ask him about our relationship see what he'll tell you about it you you should ask him the question yeah yeah, yeah. so balan entertaining can go deep on military history topics exciting likable right okay go to uh pick another podcast okay if you go to tucker perhaps you go to tucker very interesting guy, background, father, what his father did, CIA, was he not CIA, the amount of books he's read, his experience, school he went to, you know, types of people he's interviewed, his intelligence when it comes down to politics and, and then his way of being sarcastic when he's asking you a question, you don't even know he's disrespecting you and just kind of looks at you, but he just disrespected you. That Tucker will do that and wouldn't even try, right? And then length of so long of being in the game okay and that benefits him he was on mainstream for number one show for god knows three four five years crushed it right so he leaves podcast he competes with rogan i think rogan's one he's three mm -hmm. and he see where's that theo vaughn super chill likable guy fun interviewer you just like the guy yeah. and then he's he's actually very smart and he's a great storyteller and everybody just wants to be around him. You feel safe around him, right? There's yeah. something very safe around how Theo is. So then you go to Joe. How many topics can Joe go wide and deep on? Oh, my God. Everything. So many of them. Yeah. And then what platform does he have that's backing him up the last 20 years? UFC. Mm -hmm. How popular is UFC? There isn't a sport more popular than UFC. Of course, you can statistically, you can say football or WWE, but UFC to, to his audience, it's his ideal audience, right? Yeah. Now, Joe doesn't follow basketball, not football, not soccer, none of that stuff. Knows a lot about UFC, knows about fighting, knows, studies politics, health, not necessarily politics, but he's interested in it. And then comedian, so he draws from fighting, draws from comedian, 
draws from psychedelics or weed and all that stuff, right? Brings it together. They're, those audiences are all his, right? Mm. And then he has a very unique gift that not a lot of people have. He has it. He's a great conversationalist. Great conversationalist. Certain people you wake up to and you'll say, oh my God, what happened? Damn, I wonder what this person said about it. So you'll go to him. You're like, oh my God, that's what he said. Maybe you'll say, I don't care what Theo Vaughn said about it. Maybe you won't say, I don't care what such and such person said, but what did Tucker said about it? Interesting. So, 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 so. hey, what did, what did this person say about it? Interesting. So you want their commentary, mm. right? But, you know, then there's those, the person that may give you the commentary, you may not like them. Yeah. You may not like their personality. Like, you are so flippant. And I would never want to have dinner with you, but you're so freaking smart. I just want to hear what you're going to say, mm -hmm. right? That's attractive still. It's the opinion. Then there are those who are very good interviewers. Yeah. Great conversationalist where you're sitting down and talking to them. Theo Vaughn, incredible, right? Lex Friedman, very good interviewer, right? Follow-up questions, how he goes deeper into it, right? You hear how he interviews people. Uh, very, very, you know, good conversation. Rogan's there and Rogan's, people want to know what he thinks about it. And that's the last one. It's the attractive personality. You know, how attractive it is, how charming it is, how charismatic it is, or how annoying it is. Yeah. Okay, because... You know, one may follow Trump because he's such a troll. Yeah. You may not say he is the most likable guy in the world, but he's such a good shit talker. You want to hear what he's going to say today. Conor McGregor. You got Jake Paul. These are very interesting personalities. It's still part of an attractive personality. Attractive personality doesn't mean you have to like them all the yeah, time. Exactly. But they are attractive, right? So take rogan's attractive personality take his conversational style take the fact that people want to know what he thinks about xyz he's a trifecta that's why he's number one and you add the years that he's been doing it you know there's a reason why he's getting 250 million dollars from spotify after getting 200 million dollars the first time he won't be going away. and by the way he's only 54 55 years old so yeah. he's not going to be going away for a long time he'll be the first podcast billionaire he will be the first podcast billionaire so this is a segment called this or that you choose an option you don't have to say why but you can if you'd like yankees or dodgers yankees cigars or coffee oh cigars i don't drink coffee mm. trump or kamala not even close trump. <laughs> trump or reagan it's a good question for today for today it's trump for almost any other time, it's Reagan. Mm. LeBron or Jordan? Not even close. Jordan. Kobe or Jordan? It's Jordan. Mm. Even though I like Kobe more. But it's I asked Jordan. you this earlier, but Messi or Ronaldo? It's Messi. Mm. He won a World Cup for his country. You know, it's very... When I was in Argentina and I asked uh, everybody, this is pre him winning. I said, so Messi or uh, uh, Maradona? You can't ask a question like they were getting upset. I said, "Why are you getting upset? Do you have kids?" I do. What if I ask you which one of your two sons? <laughs> and I'm like, "Whoa!" By the way, and when I tell you they're getting, I'm not talking one person. Most people I asked that question in Argentina were upset with me. Wow. But I want I ask everybody because I want to know how they're. And then they said, "But the only difference why Maradona is here is because he won he won us something, hmm. and Messi hasn't done that yet. But now Messi won it as well. So did Maradona." U.S. or Iran? <laughs> I was born in Iran, but I was made in America, so it's all day U.S. English or Farsi? English. Bitcoin or gold? <sighs> this is a tough one because I have a lot of gold and I have Bitcoin. Um, if you could only hold one. I, I think it's very hard to argue against Bitcoin today. Steve Jobs or Elon Musk? It's probably going to be Jobs. Warren Buffett or Ray Dalio? Buffett. Partnership or solo entrepreneur? I'm not a solopreneur guy. So, but, but if I have to do a partnership... 
Or I guess when I say that, I mean like, like you're I'm the founder it, the, or it's like no, no, co-founder no, no. situation. I'm not doing, I'm not, I'm, I, I'm, I know what I'm doing and I trust myself partnership. It would be mayhem. Hmm. Uh, unless if it's a business, that's not the main, main core thing I'm driving. But the main thing I'm driving the holding company, I'm driving it. Hmm. So in the George Janko interview, I... Uh, you related him not wanting to be rude by looking at his phone to his birthday, right? You also talk about you and Kobe being born the same year. Uh, how important is astrology to you? What do you think of astrology? I'm always asking because 60, 70% of the time, there's some uh, uh, something there. Not all the time. Like, I've, you know, uh, you know, you'll meet certain people like, yeah, I didn't get the vibe that you were born on that day. I didn't get the vibe of this, but... You know, I always get along with February babies. Hmm. I like hiring April babies. They're very reliable. You don't offend April babies, but they're very reliable, and very independent. They'll get stuff done because it's their personality. Like it's, I'm doing it for me. I'm not trying to impress you. I'm, you know who I am? It's like, like that's the April side. Uh, September, extreme level of sensitivity, but super clean, neat, uh, good negotiators, ambassadors, somebody that can go and bring two different sites together, Libras, you know, Alexis Moody is one of the best ambassadors ever that I ran my, you know, field. Um, but yeah, I, I pay attention to it to see. One day I ran a, um, I took all my sales guys and I ran a report to see what sign made the most money in my company. Literally commissions. Yeah. So we ran the report. I'm like, it has to be my sign. Do you know who was the lowest earners in the company? Libras. Hmm. So that's why I said this is full of shit. Doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but the main thing is, you know, 60, 70 percent of the time I'm watching to see if there's any kind of a pattern. Hmm. And sometimes there is. I feel like there's a pattern too. And I'm a pretty logical person. What are you? Cancer. You're cancer. Specifically, what day? Uh 16th of July. Okay. Got it. Yeah. I've yeah. only dated cancers, which is funny. Really? Yeah. She's also a cancer? Mm -hmm. Okay. Are you very systematic, structured? It's a more creative. Yeah. More creative? Yeah. Interesting. Do you know the most famous uh, Geminis? The most famous Geminis? No. You ready to be blown away? Let's go through it. Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie, Johnny Depp, John F. Kennedy, Marilyn Monroe, Elvis Presley, Biggie, Tupac. I can go on. These are all Geminis. Hmm. Very interesting with Geminis. Super creative. Um, they can go this side to that side. One time, Too Short is uh, being interviewed. He's a rapper. I don't know if you would know Too Short. And um, they, he used to hang out with Tupac a lot. He said, one thing about Tupac, whenever you were around him, you didn't know who he was. Hmm. One moment, he's the revolutionary guy. Another moment, he wants to go party with the girls. Another moment, he's a gangster. He says, you never knew. But it would normally take about five, 10 minutes to know who he was. And then, like, that's what we're going to do that day. Because it was always so creative. Like, oh, my God, like, you know. But um, yeah, who knows? I mean, some of this stuff. I just, some some patterns that make sense to me. Do you believe in life after death? Do, like reincarnation or that you go to heaven? Heaven. I'm a Christian, so that's what, that's what I believe in. Yeah. Mm. It's funny, my um, dad's sister just passed away three days ago on last Friday. And uh, I came home and I said, I want to take you out. Let's go to dinner together. Thursday, last Thursday he passed away. She passed away. He's 82 years old. She was the older sister. His younger two brothers passed away. They were, you know, they, they were younger than him, but they passed away a while ago, 10, 15 years ago. And I'm looking at him, just eating, and I'm just looking at him. I'm looking at him steady for like 45 minutes. I'm trying to see. He's going through pain. My dad never shows pain. So he's not a guy that complains bitches at all. He's always working. Mm. And then he slipped and he said something. He says, man, they're all together now. I'm the only one that's not there with the family. So what do you mean? He says, Mom, Dad, Ellen, Johnny, Victor, I'm the only one not with them right now. And when he would tell me stories about his family in Iran, these guys have each other's back like you wouldn't believe. I took my son to dinner with him, me, Tico, and him, oldest one. We go to Casa D'Angelo because I told my wife, I'm just going to take him. You go to the soccer. I'm going to hang out with him. And, uh, and I, so I start interviewing my dad in front of my son. What could you tell him about marriage? What questions you got for your grandpa? What about this and what about that? I say, I got a question for you, pops. I said, uh, out of your siblings, the four of you, who was the hardest working guy? He says, we all work hard. I said, stop being protective of all of them. 
Who was the hardest working? We all worked hard. I mean, this guy is like a gangster. Mm -hmm. He would not throw his siblings under the bus. I said, Dad, I know all your siblings. You worked harder than all of them. No, we all, I said, Dad, what are you talking about? So I started telling him, so yeah, maybe. Defended him, right? And then I said, what'd you take away about what he just said? He says, no one comes in between the siblings. I said, these guys have each other's back like you wouldn't believe. So I, I, I sit my kids down. I say, I swear to God, if I ever see or hear a stranger make fun of your brother or your sister in front of you and you laughed and joined the stranger, you and I are gonna have a problem. Yeah. You guys can make fun of each other privately, but no stranger can make fun of you and you laugh at your sibling ever, ever. I'm not gonna tolerate that. So that's because we wanna bring these guys together. One time I'm sitting down with Michael Francis's father, Sonny Francis, and I don't know if you know his history or not. A little bit about Sonny it, yeah. Francis was known for having killed nearly 55 people. Mm. One time, this is a myth, could be true, could be not true. There's a story about him. One time he's at his house and his wife's there. A man comes and compliments his wife mm. in front of him. You can read about what he did to that guy. Really, it's a treacherous story of what he does to that guy mm. okay um i'm in new york i go visit sonny he's 103 years old i want to interview him believe it or not he's sharp as you like you wouldn't believe how sharp he was oh. at 103 so we're negotiating his lawyers show up michael shows up um we're at the old folks home i put sonny in the driver's passenger seat um shotgun i'm driving we take him to his favorite italian restaurant and I'm talking to him. I said, so Sonny, you go way back. You know Lucky Luciano. How was Lucky? Great guy. Man of character. Okay. <laughs> how, about, how about Bugsy? You'd never call him Bugsy to his face. You get to call him Ben Siegel. I said, how was Ben? Great guy. Fantastic guy. Loved him. This guy was a freaking murder killer. I said, how about Meyer Lansky? Incredible guy. Always kept his word. Richest Jewish, you know, mobster, gangster. How about Frank Costello? I'm going, I'm like, Sonny, you can't say this stuff. This is so what do you want me to tell you? This is my memory with them. Then we go to lunch. We're sitting down at lunch. This famous picture we have together at lunch. And fight breaks up between me and the lawyer. You're not going to do that. Bah, 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 bah. Finally, I'm like, Sonny, can I just ask you a question? Yeah. So you realize if you don't do an interview with somebody and allow somebody like you to ask you fair questions, where you get to tell your history one day, where people can't realize when they make the movie, the audience is never going to hear from you. Mm. They're going to make up whatever story they want to make. He says, listen, the only thing I have is that I kept Omerta till the day I died. Omerta's, you know, talking, leaking, snitching, all that stuff. He says, there's a reason I was in jail 50 plus years. He spent half of his life in jail because never once did he compromise. He says, what do you want me to do? The only thing I'm going to go to my grave with is the fact that I never snitched on anybody. My dad has a little bit of that pride of, you know, what's going to happen. So you asked me a question about whether we go to heaven or not. My dad, the way he looked at me and he said, you know, one of these days, these guys are up there and I'm not there with them. The, the life and the faith we've chosen is to believers of, be believers of Jesus as a Christian. And for 25 years, I was an atheist until I made that decision. The day I made that decision for me, um, my confidence went to a whole different level because I've always felt like he's with me. Mm. And so that's my belief today at 45. Or who's the most impressive person you've ever met? Who's the most impressive person I've ever met? I'm trying to think right now. Like it would have to be somebody because it can't just be an interview, right? You have to see this person in action. Mm. Like because the reality of it is what's more impressive is how a person is in boardrooms, how a person carries himself when they're doing business with you, how a person manages bullies, goes up against enemies, how a person handles tough situations when there's a loss of a loved one or a setback or a humiliating loss. Everything you see with people the way they are, it's a commercial. I haven't spent hundreds of hours with Trump. I've shook hands with them. We've had conversations. You know, Dana and I have had some moments together and He's impressive publicly when you see him, the way he handles business and the way he, he's straight up. The Rock and I have been spending a lot of time together lately. Kobe was very impressive backstage when him and I 
sat there and I saw the way he treated my wife and my kids. Hmm. But it's probably my dad. And I would tell you why my dad is the most impressive. I said this to my son the other day. I've never met a human being in my life that if he said he's going to do something, he does it. Hmm. I've never met a person like that. You could talk to my dad two months ago. And if he told you in two months, he's going to knit you a tie with stuff that's from Iran, just custom for you. He's going to deliver it to you a week earlier than he told you he was going to deliver it to you. By the way, 100% of the time he's done that. I've never met a more impressive person in my life than my dad. And I'm not saying this because it's a commercial. My dad's not a rich man. My dad was a cashier at a 99 cent store. Yeah. If you meet my dad, he walks like a hunchback because his stomach intestines pop out. So the only way he can keep it inside is by walking like this. Hmm. If he walks like this, it pops out. So he has to always have a tape around his stomach. So, you know, and, but this guy, man, he is no money. Nothing to show for, no inheritance of anything to brag about, $20,000, something like that. But the inheritance he left me with, whatever he's going to end up leaving me with, the values, principles, work ethic, oh, my God. An MBA, PhD, Pan, Harvard, whatever, zero comparison to it, zero. That's a, it's a billion dollar, I can't even put a dollar sign, dollar number to it. So... I have to think about this. I don't want to give you a winged answer. The most that was one of the best answers I've heard so far. The most impressive man I've ever met in my life is my dad. Last one, Patrick. Uh, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Um, I mean, you know, it, it, it changes at different stages of life. And it's, there's marriage, there's finance, there's business, there's health, there's you know, a lot of different things. I'll give you a couple of them. One of them was, so I'm at uh, Diamond Bar and this man named Rich, we're looking at an audience of 100 people in this guy's backyard, which he was neighbors with Sugar Shane Mosley. And he says, uh, I said, look, what does it take for me to compete with it? I don't want to be one of the good guys. I don't want to be one of the best. I want to be the best. I don't want to be one of five, one of 10, one of, I want to be one of one. He said, here's what you need to know. Look around this room. He turns me around and we're looking at so all these guys will read 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 books. And then eventually they'll be regurgitating the same things they ever learned. But most of these guys will eventually stop reading and working on themselves. If you continue, there's no way these guys will be able to compete with you. And yeah. that was him, number one. Number two, parenting. If you ever threaten your kids that you're going to discipline them, always come through. If you ever threaten to take away iPad, video games, food, ice cream from your kids, always come through. If your threatens don't deliver, they will never carry weight. That's that one. And then marriage, That's a good one. Um, uh, husband and wife, they were, I was getting married and they gave me this book and the first quote in that book was, marriage is the greatest mistake you'll ever make. It was quotes by people who had been married for over 50 plus years. And the first quote in the book was, marriage is the greatest mistake you'll ever make. Because as hard as marriage is, as challenges, I don't know how long I'm gonna be married. We've been married 15 years. Every year I say, we'll take, I think we can go one more year. Every year I said it at our wedding when we got married. It's very hard. It's not easy. Very, very hard because there's going to, people change. You change. She changes. Kids change. In-laws change. Health change. A lot of change. But 10 out of 10 times, I'd much rather be married than single any day of the week. The risk of being single is far greater than the risk of being married. So that's the last one I'll give you with marriage. Amazing. Well, everyone, this has been the Jack Neal Podcast. This is your guest, PBD, Patrick Bet David. Thank you for coming on. Hey, Ty, I appreciate you for having me on. This was great. Yeah.